everybody and thank you for being so patient with me. Um, so my name is Anna and I'm here to talk about uh, what me and the team with Dr. Dimitra actually have been working on with astronaut health and space radiation. Uh, first I'm going to present some sort of key concepts and then I'm going to go into what we know about it and what we can do. So first of all, I didn't really know much about this topic at all before the summer, so I've just presented a bit of a sort of brief introduction to space radiation. So first of all, radiation dose limits are cumulative, which means that unlike other things in medicine, you have a limited amount that you can be exposed to over your whole lifetime. Uh, for example, if you get a really bad sunburn when you were a young person, even if later in life you take good care of yourself, you can't actually reverse the damage that's already happened. So it's important to take in mind the astronaut's entire career. Additionally, the space environment is actively harmful to astronaut health, um, not just because of the radiation, but also for other reasons. So this is a person on Earth. Uh, the sun is shining. They're standing on the ground. Uh, and here they are without an atmosphere. So suddenly we have these solar energetic particles and we have galactic cosmic radiation, uh, which are all posing a real risk to their health uh, and which can't be managed uh, at, with, the with the atmosphere protecting them from all of the radiation um, and typical things that we would do like wear sun cream, they're just not good enough anymore. Additionally, we're floating because there's microgravity. So we have reduced muscle tone and bone mass, various cognitive changes, fluid distribution changes. Almost every single part of the body is affected by microgravity. And then we're really far away and isolated. So that has a psychological impact as well, but also having this big distance from earth to any sort of help, any supplies that might be needed. Uh, and it's important to understand all of these as working together to exert a combined impact on astronaut health. Um, radiation is a major limiting factor in establishing a long-term human space presence. Uh, this is relevant because we want to one day establish a crewed mission to Mars, uh, which is, I think, about a three-year uh, three uh, one-way journey. Uh, so six years if they want to come back. We also want to establish the Moon Gateway uh, project as well, which uh, unlike the ISS, won't be shielded by the Earth's atmosphere at all. So we need to find a way around this. So working with Dr. Dimitra Atri, what have we learned about the problem? So we wanted to investigate what research is out there regarding astronaut health with specific reference to space radiation. Uh, we were looking at current guidance. So at the moment, NASA is the only space agency with uh, crew relevant uh, radiation limits, but ESA is also working on some at the moment. I don't think it's been published yet. We were also looking at types of radiation, how the body reacts to it, and we used a systematic review methodology. We subdivided the work according to body systems. So what we've learned is that different radiation types have different effects. So those high energy solar particles and the background radiation, they have different sort of penetrations into the body. So for example, the skin and the eyes are quite superficial, but then the bones and the muscles are more deep. So they're affected by different radiation types in different ways. Additionally, different tissue types in themselves have different vulnerabilities. So depending on whether the tissue can regenerate very quickly. So for example, the skin might be better off just some of the cells might be better off dying and sort of sloughing off, whereas something a bit deeper, which might be, say, your liver, might be better if it uh, repaired the DNA damage and then renewed those cells a bit more. So it's important to understand how different tissue types are affected by radiation. As I said, NASA is the only organisation currently, but ESA is working on it. Uh, unfortunately, we found a lot of research was sort of methodologically limited. So as we said before, Radiation works together with microgravity. So if your lab is only capable of having either um, analog microgravity or uh, radiation, then you can't look at both of them in concert. Additionally, you have to combine different types of radiation. So if you can only uh, simulate those high energy rays, then you won't understand what's happening when they both work together with the low energy ones. Um, so this means that uh, there's a lack of research in terms of that, but also because we've only sent a few people up. So there's a lot of mouse models, tissue samples, um, and there's very few uh, like papers actually looking at what astronauts have experienced. So we understand that it's a problem. We understand that we need to do more research into it, but what can we actually do to keep astronauts safe? 
So before spaceflight, we can screen applicants, we can make sure that we're selecting people, for example, without a history of cancer. We can make sure that uh, if they've been a pilot previously, then they're exposed to somewhat more radiation than other people. So we can make sure that we're screening applicants that are going to be the least affected by this. Additionally, we have to understand the risks that are posed to these astronauts. And if they can understand the risks, then they can take steps to protect themselves. And we also have to do physical and psychological training. So if we know that, for example, the bones and the muscles are negatively impacted by microgravity and radiation, then we can make sure that they do lots of weightlifting before they go up. Uh, during spaceflight, so we have shielding methods, so physical methods like lead shielding around sleeping cabins uh, and other places where astronauts are going to be spending a lot of time, but also pharmacological methods. So for those deeper tissues, for example, if you want to shield the eyes, you can wear goggles, but how do you shield your internal organs? So you can take tablets and medicines and people are doing research into the various anti-radiation properties of drugs uh, to help protect astronauts. Unfortunately, we only have a handful of people that we can actually test this on in real life. So it's important to understand theoretically how it might work. Additionally, and this is the post that I've chosen, uh, we have increased satellite understanding of solar events. So if we know when there's gonna be more high energy particles, we can advise crews to take shelter in those more shielded areas of the camp. Once they get back, we can make sure that we screen them for things like cancer. We can make sure that we are checking them for any signs of radiation induced uh, health problems. And we can also protect them from later exposures. So if there's a choice between say a CT or an MRI, we can advise them to go for the non-ionizing radiation. Even though of course this has further implications because sometimes a CT is what you want rather than an MRI, but it's a consideration. So overall, this is an important and growing area of research. Uh, however, methods need to be relevant to human spaceflight and international cooperation is key. So it's fine if NASA has guidance, but crews to Mars and around the gateway won't just be with NASA. So it needs to be that everyone on the crew has the same radiation dose limits because you can't send people home halfway once they're already on their way to Mars. Thank you very much for listening. Yeah, great talk. Um, really interesting stuff. I'm wondering if, if say, say like BMSIS tomorrow, we're somehow just like a billion dollars richer and we could afford to send a spacecraft out to do some research for you. What, what are the key things that you think we should actually study right now to improve this research? If we could actually send a capsule out, you know, to, to Mars and back maybe, um, what things would you want to test for, for improving astronaut health? I think you would need to look at a variety of different samples. So I think you could take up tissue samples uh, from muscles, from various critical organs, um, and have a look at um, how the various radiation types are, are affecting them. I think also you would need to have really, really good uh, dosimeters and radiation detection methods so that you could understand exactly what type of radiation is hitting them. And I think that would be a, a good first step. Un unfortunately, we, if we could send up people, I would suggest attaching these uh, measurements to the people, but I don't know if that's possible. <laughs> or ethical, right? We, that is a question too. Like, yeah, exactly. Because then, because then also, if you don't have guidance to keep them safe, then you can't ethically send people out for many, many years, especially if the people themselves don't understand those risks. It's an important, it's an important thought. Absolutely. We have a question from Paula. Uh, she wants to know, have you by any chance looked into what should be done for astronauts during solar flares? Yeah, exactly. This is one of those examples of those high energy sort of radiation events that aren't necessarily that much of an issue for the ISS, for example, even though it does need to be taken into consideration because the ISS is still at least partially shielded by our atmosphere, whereas if we're on a mission to Mars, then that has implications for not only the astronaut health, but also the equipment that they have on board. Will it be damaged? Um, you know, if there's precious metals, we don't know how those might react to the increased radiation. So um, yeah, this, this definitely needs to be more understood. And I think also it's important to realize that even if they do run into trouble, they have to be fairly self-sufficient because especially if they're on, the, on their way to Mars, they can't just ask someone to come in and repair things or help or send any medications up that they don't already have with them. And there's always weight considerations when you think about sending lead shielding because every kilogram is fuel and needs to leave the atmosphere and it's, it's a bit complicated. <laughs> Well, um but yeah analogy right to, to ancient mariners who went out onto the ocean sometimes with no guarantee they were ever coming back you know and the, the challenges they faced and this is just a much you know even more different environment 
Um, I see a question here from Christos. Christos wants to know for how long after an astronaut returns should screening be conducted? Absolutely no idea, I'm afraid, Christos. Um, I think it would need to be conducted for as long as it takes for them to get to the same position as someone who hasn't been to space. So for example, if they've been exposed to the equivalent amount of radiation that you would expect from like, I don't know, a 50 or 60 year old um, in their thirties, then that's the sort of screening that they should be exposed to. But that's just me thinking out loud. Wonderful, any other questions for the chat or does anyone wanna unmute and ask a question? Anna, thank you for a very interesting presentation. Uh, do you have a sense of how good um, like mouse models are or other type of models that we use to assess radiation on uh, biological tissues, how good they are at uh, being representative of what humans would experience? I would imagine they're quite good, but no one's compared them directly. Um, so, or at least from what reading we've done. So we, I don't think that anyone has said, okay, well, this team found this in the, in the mouse models. So let's take a biopsy from the ISS astronauts and see if that's replicated in their tissues, which makes it really difficult. And so it's easy to say, well, we shouldn't use mouse models, but I think if they are physically possible, then we should take that like theoretical knowledge that we have and try and apply it. But until more people go to space, there just won't be the data set to analyze it against.